Welcome to AgeWise. I'm Kay Boylan, a volunteer producer for AgeWise. This past year, or the Oregon Historical Society presented a remarkable exhibit titled Strength and Diversity. It documents important story of four generations of Japanese American women. One of the most important events in the lives of these people was the relocation of 120,000 Japanese American citizens who were evacuated from their West Coast homes and sent to internment camps for the duration of World War II because of the Executive Order 9066, which was signed by President Roosevelt. The exhibit was assembled by the National Japanese American Historical Society and the Oakland Museum. And it teaches th uh, through photographs and artifacts the important roles of these four generations of women in their homes, in their community, and in society. For special insights, the Oregon Historical Society presented a panel of four generations of Oregon's Japanese American women to speak about their experiences and to bring them to the public. Today, we have this panel for you, and uh, we have one of the panelists with us. This is Sue Sakai, who is a Nisi, a second generation Japanese American. And I'm going to ask you, Sue, if you will introduce the speakers for us. Thank you, Kay. Our first panelist today is Mrs. Wako Henjoji who immigrated to the United States in early 1940. She was admitted to this country as the wife of a clergyman. She and her husband established the Henjoji Buddhist Temple, which she currently leads. Reverend and Mrs. Henjoji were sent to the Minidoka Relocation Center in Idaho during the war, where two of their children were born. Since her return to Portland, Mrs. Henjoji has established a reputation as a leader of Japanese cultural life. She is well known and respected as a leader and a teacher of flower arranging and the tea ceremony. Mrs. Henjoji will now relate her experiences as an Issei as part of the first generation who made their adaptations to American society. Mrs. Henjoji. Uh, after the outbreak of World War II, we took our two children to the Minadoka relocation camp in Idaho. Two other children were born in camp. During the war year, I was busy raising my children and was still unable to communicate in English. Um, Reverend Henjoji continued to conduct, the, conduct religious services in camp, traveling by bicycle. If he ever arrived home late, I was always fearful that he might have been taken away as were many others and interned in some other unknown place. During these years, like everyone else, we experienced many uh, disappointment, some happy times and some sad times, but managed to put them behind us uh, and were able to survive. During my teaching career, I had had occasion to display or perform demonstration in Oregon, California, Washington, Texas, Germany, and Japan. It was during these years that I had occasion to take my student on group tour to Japan many times, where 
they were able to see firsthand the secret treasure, an ancient temple, and they and the way of life in Japan. Just as the raising of the sun can melt a block of ice, it is my hope to be able to radiate through Buddhist teaching benevolence the exotic culture of way of tea and flower arrangement to men, to all mankind. Thank you very much. I am Sue Sakai, and I represent the second generation of Japanese American women, and I am known as a Nisei. I was born and raised in a small farming community in the Yakima Valley in the state of Washington and lived on that farm until the removal of all Japanese from the Western Defense Command. I am married, the mother of two children, and the proud grandmother of two grandchildren. I recently retired from my job as a medical social worker and now keep busy doing volunteer work. My interests revolve around assisting minority elderly to access services which they may need and to working on issues of cultural and racial harmony. I belong to the second generation, the Nisei. I always think of us as being the schizoid generation. <laughs> we were in the crossfire trying to balance different cultures, different beliefs, different values, found ourselves encased in a physical body that told us we were Japanese, but our environment and our educational system tried to tell us that we were Americans. So I always uh, call myself a Japanese hyphenated American, and I guess in reality that's what it is. Uh, one of these early schizoid uh, situations that I remember is that I was raised in the Presbyterian Church. And in the mornings, we would trudge off to the Presbyterian Sunday School and sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, you know, that famous little ditty. And in the afternoon, it's because my parents were Buddhists, if farm uh, work slacked off and time allowed, we would drive about 30 miles to the nearest Buddhist temple. And down in the basement, we children would sing, Buddha loves me, this I know. <laughs> So that kind of is the essence of our lives. I grew up, as Barbara said, in a farming community. My father uh, was a truck gardener uh, my, and had adjusted very well to the American way of life. He had married my mother and then uh, come to the States uh, to seek a foothold and left her in Japan. And so when he first arrived, he worked as a houseboy in a uh, fine home in Seattle, uh, learned to cook American meals, uh, learned to maintain an American-style household. And uh, I think that stood us, especially us children, in good stead in the years to come, uh, especially since my mother died when I was about 12. Uh, I should state that I was the oldest of four children. Um, I guess we lost our innocence the day that Pearl Harbor was uh, attacked. Uh, because prior to that, I did not really associate too much with Japanese. Grew up in a community uh, where there probably were more Indian children than there were Japanese children. And I can only recall one or two uh, students who were Japanese Americans in, during all the 12 years that I went to school in this valley. Um, so having grown up and having been told by our parents that we were as good as anyone and that we could achieve if we would work hard, study, um, I, and being taught in school to pledge allegiance to the flag and be a good American, uh, followed all those rituals rather religiously and um, didn't have any problems at least that uh, we as children were aware of. 
But I think Pearl Harbor Day changed our lives entirely. Um, and as Barbara mentioned, uh, we were brought here to the Portland Exposition Center. Uh, I have a difficult time attending activities there now because it brings back a rush of terrible memories of being in horse stalls. Uh, after a few months in Portland, uh, I went with my family to Heart Mountain, Wyoming, a very bleak, cold, uh, sagebrush and jackrabbits country. I left Heart Mountain after about eight or nine months. Uh, the Presbyterian Church uh, sponsored me uh, to go to a Presbyterian college in Kansas. Um, it was kind of a rude awakening when, I, uh, when the train pulled up to this little Midwestern town and I happened to glance out at the, out the train window just before it came to a jolting stop and saw this weather-beaten sign which said, Nigger, don't let the sun set on you within the city limits. And I thought, oh my goodness, what am I getting into? Um, I treaded pretty carefully for the first few months. Um, I remember a girl in the dormitory coming in and uh, trying to convert me every night. She thought I was a heathen from some strange <laughs> land uh, because in this little town in Kansas, I don't imagine they had ever seen a Japanese person. Uh, I finally had to uh, go to the house mother and ask her if she could please stop this nonsense that I was probably as good a Presbyterian as this lady who was trying to convert me. From there, I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which was another astounding experience because this was before the days of the civil rights, and black students were not allowed to enter the University of North Carolina, although it was termed the liberal spot of the South. So every day, I used to watch these Afro-Americans standing by the roadside watching me go to a school that they could not attend. I think all these life experiences have shaped the way I look at the world, the values that I hold, and probably uh, were the determining factors uh, when I became a social worker. And I felt that being, by being a social worker, I could promote social justice, work for social change, and uh, work for the things that I believed in. So I worked, I have worked for 20 years as a medical social worker, um, have had great gratification in that uh, role. Um, but I guess the role that I'm proudest of is that I am a wife and a mother and um, very happy in those roles and have two blonde blue eyed grandchildren uh, <laughs> who are a great delight. I guess I would close by saying that um, I'm no longer schizophrenic, or at least I'm not as schizo as I used to be. I'm beginning to feel that America can be a multicultural country. We have always been multi-ethnic, but we have always promoted the idea of the great melting pot, as America being the melting pot. With all the new immigration and the great increase in the minority population in this country, I think that we are now ready to, to not feel that we have to fit the Anglo pattern and that we can be a, a diverse culture and that there is unity in diversity. And if we just learn to respect differences and live with each other, uh, we can be a great uh, multicultural country. And that is my hope. Thank you. The Sansei, or the third generation, is represented by Jane Matsushima. Jane was born in the Thule Lake camp, where her parents were relocated during the war. After the war, the family returned to Portland to reestablish their lives. Jane attended Marshall High School and then went on to Oregon State. 
Professionally, Jane has worked as an elementary school teacher until she was able or felt it necessary to stay home with her children. She still works in the area of education by volunteering her time uh, in the school systems. She feels it is very important that the young people today in the schools be educated and have some knowledge about the evacuation and the relocation of Japanese Americans. While studying and thinking about the topic of the Japanese American woman, uh, as a member of the Sansei or third generation, I found myself uh, even admiring more my um, mother, who is a uh, Nisei, and my uh, grandparents, my grandmothers, and my mother-in-law, who are Iseis. As far back as I can remember, um, well, to originally, the Iseis came to a foreign country. They were determined to prove themselves as worthy Americans through their actions, both with determination and hard labor. They were willing to sacrifice their own pleasures for the future generations, their children. They survived the Great Depression only to face World War II. And as far back as I can remember, there were three points that were always emphasized throughout my life. One was the importance of education as a road to a better future. Two, that anything that we, people of the Japanese ancestry, did would reflect on all other Japanese, which is very much true even to this day. And three, that we were and are, in every sense of the word, true Americans. As mentioned, I was born in the Tule Lake camp, and after we were released from camp, our family moved to Portland. Many of the Japanese Americans in Oregon, I believe, chose to spread out and not live in a really close community. And um, my folks did this, and we lived in southeast Portland. Um, after the war, um, we did not speak Japanese. And they don't, and I, as far as I can remember, uh, didn't speak of the war. It was almost as if uh, it was a bad uh, memory, and they didn't want to talk about it. Um, in fact, I can't recall any other Japanese living or attending the Hosford uh, Elementary School, which was a K-8 school when we attended, outside my family. We were determined to blend in. When faced with prejudice, our parents always taught us to uh, take um, what they said as to ignore the ignorant. As a result, I had been accused by many as having lived with a paper bag over my head. Well, that paper bag was abruptly removed from my head when I was a senior in high school at John Marshall here in Portland, when a history teacher, um, we walked into class and they turned on this video, or a movie, it was on World War II, and it was complete with the kamikaze and the American bombers and the repeated use of the word Jap. Well, when the, t uh, when the lights went on, he immediately turned to me and said, Jeannie, what did you think of that? And I was the only Japanese in the class. Well, needless to say, I was stunned and I was emotionally uh, shocked. And because we were always taught by my parents never to uh, talk back to an adult, and we were always supposed to respect teachers, I remained speechless. Well, I believe that was the turning point in my life when I was determined that I would learn more about my ancestors and try to use this in educating others. And through that route, I decided to become a teacher. Um, I have used that in working with kids, not as my primary goal, but trying to uh, educate others. And, but after the birth of our second child, I felt fortunate that my husband allowed me to become what um, I joined the forces of a professional, full-time volunteer. And uh, through this, I've been able to work with uh, kids um, in the lower grades um, uh, and working with children and trying to show them that, a little bit about the Japanese culture, but at the same trying to show them that um, it isn't so much unlike any of the various other cultures in America that, uh, that America is multicultural. 
And since that time, I've been interested in, excuse me, learning more about my roots and to reemphasize and to extend that education to others, which has brought us to this panel. <laughs> Our Yonse, or fourth generation representative, is Kimberly Ogawa. She is a native Oregonian, having, having been born and raised in Portland. Uh, she happens to have a twin brother. Her grandparents and parents are also Portland residents. Kimberly indicates that her mother was born in the Minidoka Center. Kimberly graduated from Marshall High School and received her BA degree from Purdue University in Communications. Currently, Kimberly is an account coordinator for a local advertising company. Kimberly enjoys the closeness, closeness and support of her extended family and also has many friends. She participates in sports such as bowling and skiing. Kimberly will give you her perspective about what life is like for a Japanese American young person in American society today. Well, after these three stories, my life kind of sounds pretty dull. Um, I didn't realize that Jane and I went to the same high school, so we're fellow alumni. I probably had that same history teacher. <laughs> um, so I, I did go to a Portland public school, which was. Um, I had a lot of a lot of black friends. I didn't have very many Japanese friends, but as I grew up, I realized that other um, families that were in our community had children my age, and so we were we were taught to play with them and to accept them and to be with them and join clubs with them, go to church with them, bowl with them. And then as I graduated from high school and went on to college, I went to a real conservative college, and I was the only girl in my sorority out of 110 girls who was Asian. And the, the real odd thing about that is they never said that I was Japanese, but I was either Oriental or I was Asian. And I, you know, so there's a difference between that. And then we went through this whole spiel about, well, how do, how do Asians tell what other Asians are? Whether they're <laughs> Filipino, Japanese, Chinese. And so I made some story up and said, we can always tell by the last syllable of their, the last vowel of their name. <laughs> People believe that. So that, that was interesting when I was going to college. But now that I'm, I'm older now and I live on my own and I work in an industry that um, is very people-oriented, very communication-oriented, it's interesting um, what people at my office say about me. They say that I must have an, an enormous family because I know every Japanese person in the city. I go to a, a, a blazer game and I can wave at a whole group of Japanese people. Or I go to a restaurant. Um, anywhere in the city and run into a Japanese person, they say, that must be your uncle or your, <laughs> or your aunt or somebody. And it usually is a cousin or a, a distant relative or something. But my parents have always encouraged us to um, join community groups. And one thing that we do is um, we bowl. A lot of Japanese people bowl at a bowling alley. And my American friends come down to see me some Friday nights, and they say, I've never seen so many Japanese people in one place in my entire life and I said well you should come to my Christmas parties or you know things like that and it's interesting because I never think of myself as being different it's just that I always think of myself as being fortunate enough to live in a community where um, people are very close and um, we respect each other's families and their backgrounds and the history is very interesting to me because my mother my grandmother and my grandfather were both born in Portland my father was born in Idaho, and my mother was born in Minidoka in the camp, the same as Jane. And they have stories that are just so bizarre to me that I think that I'll, in my lifetime I'll never, ever go through any of that, and I'll never be s subject to any sort of major prejudice. And I'm very fortunate to say that all in my entire life I've never been called a Jap. I've never been... Um, talked in a derogatory manner about my heritage, and I think I'm very lucky. I think that if that something like that were to happen to me now, I'm not sure how I would deal with it, but probably in a lot stronger, more confident manner that I'm not ashamed and that I have an enormous family and um, a wonderful community and that I'm very fortunate and very lucky that people around me know my, know my family and know my background, and I'm very comfortable with that.
Uh, so I guess I'd like a comment from any or all of you, first of all, on the lack of information about the Japanese-American experience during the uh, World War II, and also then because of the feelings that you have, uh, what emotions do you have about others learning about that, and perhaps some reluctance too? I'm not sure. Thanks. That's a pretty heavy question. <laughs> I think um, we, we went through different phases. I think first was denial and just kind of feeling that such a thing really didn't happen, but we know that it did. Um, the feelings it brings up for me is one of great disappointment. Uh, people often ask, aren't you bitter, aren't you angry? And I said, no, because that really doesn't do me any good to live my life in anger or in bitterness. Uh, but it was a great disappointment because as a child growing up, I held those American ideals very high and really believed in them, that there was liberty and justice for all. And then all of a sudden to be denied all your basic civil rights was a tremendous blow. I, I remember one really neat uh, teacher out at Cedar Park, and I still see her occasionally at the Pops concerts, uh, who took a whole week of her history class and just uh, focused on the wartime relocation of Japanese Americans. And it was a, a great learning experience for those kids. And sixth, seventh graders are pretty open, and they would ask us all kinds of questions. And um, I felt it was a successful program. I would agree with you that we really need to do more so that more people are aware of what happened to the Japanese Americans during the wartime, during Second World War, uh, for several reasons. One, we need to make sure that it doesn't ever happen again to any other group of people. And I think that's very important. If you wish more information on this issue, you may contact the Japanese Ancestral Society, 654-9437, or the Oregon Historical Society, 222-1741. Thank you, Sue, for being co-host today and for introducing the panelists for us. And thank you also for watching. We'd like to hear from you. Uh, please give us uh, a phone call. The number is 282-8634. We hope we'll see you next week.